Hello there. This is Bonnie Gasper with the Child Protection League. The title of this presentation is called Cultural Marxists Know They Are in a War, But Do You? When Child Protection League hosted its first major event back in 2014, we called it the Raging War on Kids. We recognized long ago that we were in the middle of a culture war and our kids were the targets. The change agents intend to indoctrinate our children throughout their entire education so they leave as radicalized, controllable activists. Now this war has only ramped up, so we updated our mission statement to reflect this. We now include it as one of our targeted issues on our redesigned website. But CPL is committed to promoting the welfare of children and protecting them from exploitation, indoctrination, and violence. We equip and activate parents and the public to reclaim self-governance and to expose and defeat the cultural revolution in our midst. We follow cultural trends, public policy, legislation, education, and curriculum, and then we educate and equip parents and you, the public, about these issues. We're a nonprofit that originally formed in 2013 to defeat the Safe and Supportive Schools Act, which we renamed the Bullying Bill, which was House File 826. It was not a popular position to be against an anti-bullying bill, but we knew the bill established a huge new bureaucracy whose purpose was to codify into law all the things we are fighting today. It identified gender nonconforming people as oppressed with special protections. It identified normative heterosexuality, in other words, the binary, as an oppressive belief system. It was going to mandate school instruction in gender ideology, ultimately enforce compelled speech, and was undermining parental rights. Now this bill is a sophisticated example of what we're going to be talking about tonight, a war of language. It's a psyops war of words. This bill was written by Marxists using an equity lens and all their radical interpretations of harmless sounding words. So today when you look around, it kind of feels like everything has gone off the rails all at the same time. It's becoming very hard to trust anything you read or hear. Sometimes you feel like you're the only one who seems to see a problem. Others are just oblivious. And you probably have some family members who think you're a little nutty. Well, you're in good company. C.S. Lewis once said, when the whole world is running towards a cliff, he who is running the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. Well, that's what the cultural Marxists would have us believe, that we're the crazies. In fact, that's what our wannabe dictator Joe Biden would have us believe, that the patriots here are dangerous extremists, domestic terrorists, evil, hate-filled bigots, people who are anti-science and reality. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. So let's start with a very short history lesson, ironically about an old, dead white guy. Karl Marx was born in 1818 in the city of Trier, Prussia, which is now in Germany. Now, the first thing you need to learn to under understand about him is that he developed an entire theory of the proletariat, which is another word for the working class, without ever having set foot on the floor of a factory. So lest you think Marxism arose from a personal response to the actual conditions of workers in the 19th century, it didn't. It arose as a critique of German philosophy. So Marx was really a pseudo-philosopher projecting his beliefs, his worldview on the masses, and he really wasn't an intellectual or an economist or even an experienced in the working class. He was just another elite talking head who thought he knew better than the regular guy what was good for him. But some of the things that he truly despised were religion, independent thinking and independence, capitalism, pri and private property. Now, foundational to this philosophy was that liberal democracies were fundamentally flawed because they permitted people to practice their religion as they wished. He saw this as a defect because religion was to be abolished. Even personalized religion was, was in his mind even worse. You weren't even supposed to have your own private thoughts. Now, he didn't bother trying to refute religion. He just out, flat out rejected it. He believed in human emancipation. He wanted man to revolve around himself as his own true little son. He believed man was his own little g-god. So that's why he called religion the opium of the people. He said it actually made them accept their oppression, but it was oppression that Marx was projecting onto them. Now he fundamentally believed that man could not be motivated by self-interest and the common good at the same time. He believed these were contradictory concepts and could not coexist. He believed that human beings could be transformed to make them good, but it was, again, his definition of good. So to achieve this then required the destruction of individuality, independence, and personal responsibility. 
He said we had to modify the conditions of civilization, abolish private property, and institute communism, because only then would we recover and become our authentic Marxist selves. He believed we were all Marxists at heart. That's why he said you have to abolish property, the family, and any sense of patriotism and nationalism, because these things separate us from all of humanity. It placed boundaries around us which we were willing to protect and willing to defend. It flew in the face of the big lie of communism, which was that we could achieve some kind of worldwide brotherhood. But to achieve this worldwide brotherhood, it required a revolution. He wanted to totally restructure economics because everybody was in a class struggle. And Marx wanted people to revolt by violence. So he wanted violent revolution, which is a reason 100 million souls were killed by Marxism over the course of its bloody battles. So let's fast forward to America. Since violent revolution didn't work out very well all over the world, and democracy and Western civilization really were things people were trying to aspire to, they set their sights on America, the city on the hill. We were, and hopefully still remain, the symbol of liberty and freedom. But these are things Marxists totally hated. So they tried to muster up support for violent revolution on our college campuses in the 60s. But that didn't work well either, because normal people just don't have an appetite to riot and revolt against their neighbors and friends. The 60s did see rioting, of course, partly because it was during the civil rights era, but it never became the wholesale outright revolt they wanted, because most Americans believed in the American dream. Most Americans wanted to aspire to improve their lot in life. They believed in a good work ethic. They wanted to leave an improved condition for the next generation. They also wanted to acquire private property and enjoy the fruit of their labor. And they took personal responsibility and civic duty seriously. Now again, these are all attributes of Western civilization, which are really uh, rooted in Judeo-Christian values, which are found in the Bible, which cultural Marxists despise the most. So you will see that I'm going to be referencing the traditional values of Western civilization as the contrast because it's what the Marxists targeted themselves. Since the attempt for violent revolution gained little traction in the 60s, the Marxists already had Plan B in place, targeting education and the media. So teachings from people like Wilhelm Reich, Antonio Gramsci, Alfred Kinsey, and the Frankfurt School took academia by storm in the 60s. They understood that culture, not economics, was the center of any revolution. They recognized that if you can change the culture, you will achieve cultural revolution. Gramsci famously said, if you can change the way children think and speak, you would create social change. And if you change how they think and speak, you will change what they believe, which will change their worldview, which will change what they will stand for, fight for, and fall for, which will ultimately result in cultural revolution without firing a shot. Gramsci is known as the father of cultural Marxism. Now, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about each of these men due to time. We have other presentations which show you what they taught and how they embedded it in curriculum today, but for tonight, I'm just going to focus on their tactics. Because we're in an information war, a propaganda war, it started 70 years ago in our educational system. Herbert Marcuse, a German communist involved with the Frankfurt School, once said, we have to go into the institutions and it has also been famously called the Long March Through the Institutions. It's, so it's really just a total psyops, psychological warfare, one of the oldest yet primary tactical battle strategies of any war. And because it's so effective, you can demoralize, turn, or conquer your enemy literally through leaflets, paper bullets, and change their behavior. And boy, we did see that in spades during COVID. From an online exhibit about psychological warfare during World War II, propaganda, or the process of influencing the thoughts and the emotions of an individual or a group of people, has been used throughout history, particularly in warfare. During World War I, propaganda became accepted as a modern military weapon, crucial to successful military campaigns. The use of propaganda by military powers on both sides of the conflict increased exponentially during World War II. At that time, the term psychological warfare, or psy war, replaced the word propaganda. It developed then as a nonviolent weapon meant to influence enemy soldiers and civilians through the use of paper leaflets or paper bullets to demoralize, to weaken, and convince a soldier to surrender to a stronger military force. Adolf Hitler famously wrote in Mein Kampf, propaganda is a truly terrible weapon in the hands of an expert. His Nazi propaganda campaign cost the lives of 55 million people, including 6 million Jewish men, women, and children. 
But the common qualities of propaganda rest upon two primary things, its power and how it works. The power relies on its message, technique, the means of communication, the environment from which it's um, arising, and the receptivity of the audience. And it works by using truths, half-truths, or lies. It omits information selectively. It's always emotional and not fact-based in its arguments. It champions a cause. It attacks and censors those opposed to it. And it targets desired audiences. So were these marks as successful? Well, I briefly mentioned the Frankfurt School, but I'd like you to listen to the short clip that recently played on, on The War Room, where Ben Harnwell is talking about the goals of the Frankfurt School. Steve, they needed a sense of hopelessness, Steve. They needed a sense of hopelessness so that people would give up in the system and embrace the Marxist revolution. And this is what the Frankfurt School, back in when it was in its original founding in um, 1923, realized that their big task was, right, was to destroy the, the, the Judeo-Christian um, civilizations. It was a it was a a source, a spring of hope. They needed to destroy that in order to leave the people helpless. Now, what was their strategy? Here's something I'm going to list off, and you can tell me where you think we are on this list, okay? The creation of racism offences. Continual change to create confusion. The teaching of sex and homosexuality to children. The undermining of schools and teachers' authority. Huge immigration to destroy identity. The emptying of churches, an unreliable legal system with bias against victims of crime, dependency on the state and state benefits, control and dumbing down of media, and the encouraging of the breakdown of the family. So I'll let people uh, calculate for themselves how successful that very radical plan has been. Okay, so that's... So have you ever heard of the Frankfurt School and their transformational goals before? Well, after they fled Germany, they regrouped in America and targeted our teaching colleges. And that radical list, that was created many, many decades ago. And where do you think we are in that list? It sounds like they have pretty much achieved them all. So those leaflets, those paper bullets, have become woke curriculum, vulgar and pornographic books for kids, the mainstream media, drag queen story hour, open borders, no discipline in the schools, lax sentencing guidelines, and on and on. Now we could talk about every single one of those things for an hour, especially the invasion of America that's going on in our open borders. Hundreds of thousands of military aged men now are flowing across and spreading out all over America. Or how about the child trafficking crisis that's being fueled by our open borders? We could talk about how regional governance is replacing representative government and is not aligned with American sovereignty, but the UN's Agenda 2030 and its Sustainable Development Goals. In fact, we could talk about Agenda 2030's plans for 15-minute cities and digital passports and digital currency, which will create digital prisons for all of us by restricting what we buy, where we can go, and what we can do. But I'm going to concentrate on how the Marxists are transforming our children's identities because it all starts there. The change agents destroy their identity, their individual, social, and national identity, and then re-educate and refashion them into controllable, predictable, global citizens who will champion all of the Marxist goals. So this is a war against children, and we all need to understand that right now. And why children, specifically? Because their minds are like wet cement. Whatever lands on them sticks. They are defenseless. They're too young to have a working knowledge of the marketplace of ideas. They sit in classrooms before an authority figure which we have told them to honor and respect as their minds are being filled with things that are not true. They are captive, soft, and vulnerable targets. I like how Eric Metaxas said it the other day. He said we have to recognize that what's going on with our children is beyond indoctrination. Our kids are actually being evangelized by the cultural Marxists. And he's correct because cultural Marxism is a religion. It's a religion with its own theology, doctrine, and sacraments. But here's how they're doing it then. And again, if you're in a war, you need to know the enemy's agenda and tactics. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself in an ambush. Gramsci and his ilk identified four fundamental tactics to change the culture from within. First, you have to deconstruct the language to change the cultural narrative, the meta-narratives. 
It means taking something apart to look for or reinterpret something that really is not there. And all of the words they are being uh, they use are being filtered through their Marxist lens. It's their worldview. In fact, it's been said they use the same words we do, but they use a very different dictionary. Then you have to abolish objective truth. Now, cultural Marxists said truth is relative. Since they do not believe in God, they believe that man is his own God. Therefore, he answers to no authority and can do whatever he wants. As a result in this made-up world, then, which rejects any kind of absolute truth, you can have personal truths that are diametrically opposed, but somehow can both be true at the same time, just because they're sincerely believed. Well, is this even possible? Can that even be true? What does truth mean by definition? Truth means what's actually real, reality, and is true for everybody whether they wish to believe it or not. Truth that is based upon sincerity of belief is simply an opinion. It's not a personal truth. It's a personal opinion. And as we are seeing today, more often it's a personal delusion. And think about what's happening here then when kids are taught there's no such thing as absolute truth and that opposing truths can somehow both be true at the same time just because they're sincerely believed. It places children in an impossible position, a constant state of cognitive dissonance, which causes a lot of anxiety since they're being told to disbelieve what they can see with their own eyes and to believe what is objectively and visibly false as another truth, quote unquote, which makes them wonder, what does truth really mean then? So is it any wonder that our young people are experiencing a mental health crisis? crisis? They feel help, hopeless, lost. Things just don't make sense. Well, this is total mind corruption. It's subtle, but terribly destructive. Then you must emphasize group identities and assign power to those identities to create discontent, agitation, jealousy, and victimhood. Man, there's no better way to divide a culture and create disunity than to tear down our own historical structures, laws, system of government, and social constructs and to beat a constant drum that our whole system is racist and it has only benefited certain people who and always victimize others. It also flies in the face of the true nature about personal worth, value, and personal responsibility. Children are taught they are guilty or innocent by association, and therefore not responsible for their own actions and decisions. So if this is true, then there's no need for repentance and no place for forgiveness. It's only retribution, equity, which is really vengeance. It's a totally toxic and destructive heresy. Then children must be sexualized and the traditional family destroyed. Through curriculum, books, culture, laws, media, etc. There are no sexual boundaries anymore or guardrails or constraints. Sex is not presented as something sacred and special and reserved for marriage between one man and one woman. Oh, not today. The kids are taught that sex is a right. Sexual pleasure is their right, and it's purely recreational. Their bodies literally are sexual playgrounds. Sex is also about as mundane as going out to play in the playground, too. It's nothing special, just casual, like breathing. They're being taught that they can be whatever they want, do whatever they want, whenever they want, with whomever they want. And it's all perfectly normal. It's a Marxist who rejects science and natural law when they claim gender is a construct and that there are hundreds of genders. They reject reproductive biology and the natural law of every species when they claim men can have children and be chest feeders. Everybody in species know there are male organs and female organs. One gives and one receives and together they create. So it's a full rejection of genetics to claim there are no biological differences between men and women and that it's fair for men to compete against women in sports. It's a rejection of common sense to claim that your daughter is at no physical or personal risk when adult men are in her bathroom, shower, and locker room because these men identifying as women are just gentle souls looking for validation of their authentic selves. I mean, it's literally madness. It's insanity. Since the beginning of time, all cultures have recognized the scientific and biological reality the truth of two genders, and that traditional marriage is between a man and a woman. So these Marxists, they, deny, they are the deniers. They deny historical reality, genetic reality, biological reality, scientific reality, and common sense. So when Judeo-Christian values were kicked out of school, something else replaced them. Something always replaces what is missing. They were replaced by secular humanism, which is a different religion. It's actually secular humanism seasoned with pagan Gaia worship when you include all the hysterical claims about climate change. So Johnny basically can't read because he's taken religious classes that are teaching him how to become an angry Marxist. 
And since Marxists use language and words as their primary strategy for cultural revolution to change how children think and speak, we're going to talk about some key identity words today. It's not because we have some kind of obsession with LGBTQ issues or gender. It's simply because identity is what the Marxists themsel themselves are targeting. They are making it the issue. And since every other institution and mountain of influence has already been captured, like media, business, education, culture, government, government, even medicine today, this is another reason Johnny can't read. He can't think. All of these lies are coming at him from every direction. The only safe place is his family right now. So that's why the enemy is going after the image bearers of God, the children, the family. Since he's captured the others, the family is the last obstacle standing in his way. Because when you remove the truth about who kids are, their intrinsic value and purpose, when you strip all of this away, what's left for them but confusion, depression, suicidal thoughts, and hopelessness? So under this whole Marxist LGBTQ gender confusion umbrella, they're creating generations of children who think they can actually change their sex. Gender confused children often pursue drugs and bodily mutilation, which results in a whole host of physical and emotional problems, not to mention sterilization. Now this actually is, a, is an accurate picture. It really is modern day eugenics. Marxists are literally sterilizing emotionally disturbed children. This used to be illegal in America. And I tell you, by the way, Governor Walz, he is a skilled propagandist. His 2023 executive order made Minnesota a sanctuary state for children to have their healthy bodies mutilated. Even though the EO was just a few pages long, he called it medically necessary health care nine times and gender affirming health care 24 times. This is carefully crafted language, which creates a sense of urgency and finality by saying this Frankenstein approach for gender confused kids is their only hope. Yeah, he's a very skilled Marxist. He's skilled at this word, word game. So let's quickly take a look then at how they have deconstructed the word gender as it relates to identities. They now say gender is assigned at birth. So this infers then that the doctor, rather than discerning the sex of a baby by simply looking at their genitalia, he made his best guess. Maybe he flipped a coin. Or maybe there were plenty of boys born that day in the hospital. I mean, this is nonsense and flies in the face of biological reality. They also claim that gender and sex aren't the same. By removing verifiable biology and making gender a construct, they've opened the door to total fabrication by claiming behaviors, desires, and expressions define gender. So it's basically whatever a kid wants to experience or make up. Again, this is a total delusion. It's like a Build-A-Bear approach to creating gender out of thin air because it's rooted in feelings, not objective reality. This brief clip of Kelly Robinson's testimony before Congress, it's exhibit A that we're living in the theater of the absurd. It's hard to believe that these are the kinds of conversations being had and being taken seriously on Capitol Hill, but give it a listen. Um, but sex is okay, assigned so at birth. Three, I'm just trying to understand. I'm thoroughly confused. So you're, you're born, I'm talking about biology, male, female, and what else? I believe that intersex is also acknowledged. Intersex. But again, I, I'm not a doctor here. What I can and say what does intersex mean? is that there's a difference between sex and gender. And different. I think in these conversations, we're conflating the two. And how many genders are there? I think the gender is expansive, and the definitions are always growing. Um, you know, today I can tell you, More I talk to five. young people More that talk about non-binary as more. gender is not a binary is what I'm trying but to is, say. But are there more than five genders? I'm just trying to understand. Are there more than five genders? Well, I mean, I think that there was a time where women wearing pants didn't feel like it was appropriate for their gender, are, and yet I'm wearing pants today. There, I think that there are ways that we question. express are our there gender more than that are five expansive. Genders? Are there more than five? I mean, how many genders there are, but what I can say is, is that gender is a reflection. Number? Excuse me? There's an infinite number of genders? I think depending on your culture, there are a lot of different genders that, that exist. And I can also say that it's a term that's evolving. If you look at young people today, we have only woman and man. So I think that it's incumbent upon us not to legislate on this, but create space for them to explore what their identities are, what their gender identities. You know, do you ever wonder if future generations are going to look back on stuff like this and wonder what in the world were they thinking? I guess I'll have to summarize. We weren't thinking. 
uh, really. Uh, but by the way, intersex is not a third sex, which they like to infer that it is. It's actually an abnormality. It's an anomaly. Something actually went genetically wrong. Then they deconstructed gender affirming. Once children are convinced they can change their gender, then reality gets flipped on its head by saying affirming the delusion is now gender affirming. They have taught kids to ignore and not believe what they can see with their own eyes and instead trust their feelings, and everyone must affirm those feelings to love them. This is so destructive on so many levels. Then preferred pronouns. This is a blunt force instrument which forces everybody else to participate in the delusion, and in some states it now carries the weight of the law behind it. It can cost you your job or convict you of a hate crime. And the word transgender, honestly, there is no such thing. Nobody can change from one sex to another. A woman can dress like a man, look like a man, sound like a man, even have fake men stuff attached to her body, but she will never be a man. It's biologically impossible. Her DNA does not change. Every cell in her body is either male or female based upon her biological sex. So being trans is a very grand delusion. We must stop using this term. Nobody is transitioning to the other sex. Nobody ever has. Nobody can. And nobody ever will. The largest demographic experiencing the highest rates of children wanting to quote unquote transition are young girls in white suburban families. But I think you might find the, the reason why very interesting. Not only is puberty awkward anyway, they are now also immersed in this racist pedagogy called CRT, critical race theory. So if you're white and straight, you are an oppressor and irredeemable. You are a white supremacist by birth. So you cannot be forgiven. So you have to fully so you have to either fully renounce yourself, your heritage, and either become a champion of the perceived victims or become a victim yourself. And since every child is looking for their people, they want to belong, they want to be accepted, and straight white kids are not acceptable today, young girls are going in gangs to plan parenthood clinics to get cross sex hormones. It's been rightly called a social contagion. Just a few months ago, NBC reported that three in five teen girls said they feel persistently sad or hopeless. That's 57%. And 30% said they have seriously considered committing suicide. Not only that, almost 40% of Gen Zs self-identify as somewhere on the gender spectrum. It is indeed a pandemic of an identity crisis. This is a culture that has devolved into madness. Our medical institution has devolved into madness. It's a theater of the absurd. But remember, gender-affirming health care is actually quite lucrative because it conscript, conscripts a kid to a lifetime of hormones, drugs, medical interventions, and almost always ongoing antidepressants and antipsychotic meds because they're still suicidal, even when they do all this stuff to themselves. So we have to stand against it because if we play along, we're part of the problem. And as we're seeing, more and more young people are trying to detransition, trying to recover their original bodies, voices, hairlines, breasts, etc. It's really heartbreaking to hear their stories. And almost unanimously they cry, why didn't the adults in the room stop me? What makes us think a child who is too young to drive, drink, smoke, or vote is mature enough to understand what these kinds of decisions entail long term for them? And since when have we allowed the suicidal individual to dictate their plan of care? It's ludicrous. So what can we do? How do we take back the four things being used against us? How do we teach our children what is true, good, and beautiful? Well, first, we have to fully grasp the power of language in shaping their worldview. Do not underestimate the power of language. Don't for a moment think that these are harmless words or passing fancies. If that were true, they would not be so carefully crafted to deceive us. Also, don't believe it's harmless to just go along to get along. Nothing could be further from the truth because this is a war tactic. Reject the woke language and speak truth, because if you don't, it starts to change how you think too. And teach absolute truth. Do not shrink from this. Truth is true, by definition, whether one believes it or not. If it's not actually true, it's an opinion. And you must recognize the filter or lens through which every claim is being made. Be astute to the lingo and the buzzwords. And then affirm your child's true identity. Rebuke the race language. We are one blood, one human race. We're just different ethnicities. The claim that there are different races is full-on Darwinism, which is a totally racist theory of evolution. It's racist on its face. It implies hierarchy, that some, have, uh, some ethnicities have somehow not evolved more than others. 
and affirm science, biology, and traditional values for sex and marriage. You don't even have to be a Christian or, or hold those values to understand that sex that is regarded as something special to be enjoyed within a loving marriage between a man and a woman comes with tons of unexpected blessings and protections, incredible societal benefits too. Think for a moment if mankind could have managed to honor the divine design for marriage in, in full commitment to marriage. The following societal problems would have been eliminated or greatly reduced. Sexually transmitted diseases. Abortions. Broken homes. Fatherless children face significant disadvantages in life. Zero Hedge released a bombshell report a few weeks ago showing one in four children live in homes without a father. In fatherless homes, they found significantly higher rates of poverty, academic failure, crime, emotional and psychological problems as well. Could we have stamped on the appetites for pedophilia or prostitution and porn? And how about the crisis of human trafficking? How about depression, emotional disorders and abuse over broken sexual rela relationships? The female body is designed to emotionally and chemically bond with any man she has intimacy with. During sex, she releases the same bonding hormone she does when she's nursing her baby. It's that powerful. So the hookup culture, it's been catastrophic for women. It's creating a whole host of eating disorders, cutting, depression, suicidal thoughts, and on and on and on. So if you have any young women in your life, please have them read Dr. Miriam Grossman's book, Unprotected. So are you starting to see why cultural Marxists have targeted our children and families for destruction? They know that destabilizing people and families destabilizes the entire civilization because they know that when families and the culture become dysfunctional, the whole foundation for peace, prosperity, and hope crumbles as well. That's because civilizations were built by men with families to feed. When families become dysfunctional or cease to form altogether, growing numbers of children suffer in ways that have little to do with lack of money, when communities are no longer bound by their members' web of mutual obligations, the continuing human needs must be handed over to bureaucracies, the bluntest, clumsiest of all tools for giving people the kind of help they need. The neighborhood becomes a sterile place to live at best, and at worst, becomes a Hobbesian, all against all free fire zone that we have seen in some of our major cities. So what Murray was really saying in his book, Coming Apart, was that when the family is broken apart, something else swoops in to fill it, fill in what's missing, and it's never good. So how do we begin to rebuild our culture? In order to be winners of souls, we must first be weepers of souls. As Charles Spurgeon said, what's going on in our country should break our hearts and move us to do something, not just yell at the darkness. Then you need to suit up because this is a war. It's a spiritual battle. What we're dealing here with here is evil. It's demonic. Nobody can afford to be just a spectator. We must never lose sight of our mission because of our outrage over the cultural chaos. You will not help the lost and hurting people by affirming their delusion or condoning the lies because what you're really doing is affirming their hatred of themselves. And you will not help them by condemning them either. So be prepared to speak truth with gentleness and self-control. We must hold the line on the truth and against the lies. Because Here's the reality. The truth can handle a few questions. It really can. It can stand up to public scrutiny because it's true. That's why censorship and silencing of the truth is their only strategy because that's all they have. Their theater of the absurd isn't built on reality or evidence. So we must deal very differently with a gender-confused child who's hurting than a grown adult who's grooming them on purpose. And grooming here means much more than sexual grooming. After all you've heard today, I hope you fully understand that ideological groomers are raping the minds of our children. They are literally polluting their minds to reshape what they believe and how they think about themselves in the world. And it's not enough to be a helicopter parent anymore. You need to be a fighter jet parent. Again, we're in a spiritual war. It's evil and it wants to destroy us. So become grounded in your faith. Whether you're Christian, Jewish, or something else, the fact is Marxism targets the Judeo-Christian faith for destruction because it's a principal obstacle to their victory. Judeo-Christian values were the foundation of Western civilization, the core principles of a belief in a creator God, individual liberty, the sanctity of and respect for human life, individual responsibility, standards of morality that are true for all people, etc. All of these things are being torn down. And if we lose them, we're going to lose our country. Now, I'm a Christian. I believe Christ is the truth, and he's the one I would recommend to you. 
and crit and as a christian we recognize this started all the way back in the garden when satan asked eve did god really say well it was an information war from the start it was a war over words a psyops but note something else while it was eve who was deceived adam was with her and didn't say anything he didn't man up lead or speak out he just passively stood there and watched his wife crash and burn so this is a psychological battle it's a war against truth it's as old as time, and we need to start seeing it for what it is, a spiritual and ideological battle for the hearts and minds of our children, their children, and the future of our country. Because, again, the Marxist goal is cultural revolution, where evil is called good and good is called evil. So shore up your own family. Teach your children the truth and the richness of our American heritage. Don't play along with the lies and delusions. Teach your kids how to do the same without being offensive. Read good classical literature. Have hist uh, story times of your own. In fact, the library is a public space and you have every right to use it. Book it solid so the drag queens have nowhere to go. Start after school clubs which focus on real history. Monitor screen time. Today the average 8 to 12 year old spends 5 hours a day on his devices. For the 12 to 17 year old, it jumps to eight hours a day, and that's the average. And did you know that the average age that a young boy gets exposed to hardcore porn is only eight? A friend recently suggested that our phones are a lot like modern day Ouija boards, and it's true when you think about it. We ask it questions, we are interacting with AI. Well, who has programmed these entities? What's the filter? Social media platforms are filled with groomers, predators, and pedos. Look at what we now know about Instagram using algorithms to connect a massive pedo network together. Invite young people into your home too. Do things like the Truth Project, which was just a phenomenal set of videos that changed the direction of several young people who I invited into my home many years ago. And get involved. Support organizations like mine that are working to protect children from these mind rapists and groomers. Like most, we're all volunteers who've been called to the task, and we can only continue our work by the generous financial support from people like you. And stand up to your school board. There is strength in numbers. And if you have brave teachers and school board members, have their back. Don't leave them on the battlefield alone. They really need to know that you're with them. They need the public display of support. And strongly consider public school exit. Someone explained it like this. If someone offered your kid a glass of water and said there's just a little bit of poison in it, well, how much is too much? If your kids are in a non-public school, be sure you aren't just paying extra for public school curriculum too. Many private schools are bringing in social emotional learning, critical race theory, and all the other bad curriculum. Understand the new Marxist Minnesota teacher licensing requirements. We have a lot of information on our website explaining what they are and what they mean in more detail. And make it your job to understand the PSYOPs and to help others to do the same. And be like Martin Treptow. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan gave a speech which was titled, Freedom is Not Free. Well, he told the story of a young American who lied about his age so he could fight in the war. He died on the front lines, but on his body they found a notebook. He had written this on the flyleaf. He said, America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended upon me alone. This is exactly what we need to do. We must work. We must save, we must sacrifice, and we must endure and fight cheerfully, doing our utmost as if the whole struggle depended upon us alone. Because this is who we are, and our kids and our country are worth fighting for. You can find tons of free resources on our website. If you appreciate what we do, please sign up for our email updates there and consider supporting our ongoing work financially. You can also listen to subject matter webinars and recorded presentations on our Rumble channel and on our website. And finally, we're bringing in Dr. James Lindsay, October 11th, 2023. He is the nation's foremost expert on social emotional learning and it's really a do not miss event. He is in extremely high demand. Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, Steve Bannon, Glenn Beck, countless others have conducted powerful interviews with him. Tickets are going fast, so please register right away if you want to learn tons about cultural Marxism and social-emotional learning. Thank you.